uh, just want to introduce this roundtable. And the idea is just to explore really just the practical steps, some of the emotional challenges and hurdles, and the mindset sh a mindset <laughs> shifts. <laughs> Really required to make the leap in what I'm trading. Yeah, excuse my language. Um, but first and foremost, I want to uh, again welcome the coaches back to the stage and uh, allow Daniel and Igor and Severin to give a few opening words. Yeah, so I, I, I'm really happy with how the event is going so far. Really amazing feedback. And uh, obviously, tomorrow we've got Severin's strategy, new strategy, brand new strategy coming up for just you guys here. So uh, I think it's going to be. Uh, uh, a special day again tomorrow, and yeah, I'm uh, loving the feedback and, and how this has gone so far. Yeah, same here. I'm, I'm, I, I really enjoy uh, listening to your stories and how you've come so far. Um, it's always nice as well to have the, um, um, well, not criticism, but you know, the ideas that you guys share, um, because it's in this type of event that when we actually talk to people like face to face, that we really understand um, what your requirements are. Um, so I think these open like conversations are really, really helpful because then we can see, okay, well, there's definitely a lack of A, B or C or whatever it may be. And then we can go back and think about, you know, potential lesson, um, you know, how we can help, what can we change to, you know, make it better. And um, so yeah, do share, do, you know, talk to us, and um, yeah, we've got the strategy tomorrow, I'm looking forward to that, and the uh, round table now, it's from the transition, um, it's a very important topic, I personally would like to keep it really open, so please do share, and um, so yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah, I can also um, only echo, echo all your words, so uh, I've been really enjoying this event. I'm looking forward to getting more feedback, getting to know some more people, and just as Igor was saying, so for this next roundtable, um, if you ever want to share something, please let us know, and you can do that, because um, this can be an open type discussion, and some of you, as we heard from you earlier today, um, already experienced the transition to full time, so it's always nice to share your ideas as well. And yeah, looking forward to that. So handing it over to you now, Scott. Wonderful. And before we get started, I just wanted to share a few statistics that I found quite interesting. And many of us have heard this one before, but it's estimated that over 90% of traders fail to become consistently profitable. And I think this highlights the importance and the need for education, risk management, and sound trading practices before you're adding real money into your accounts. Um, and so I know we've all heard this before. Maybe it's 95%, maybe it's 90%, but Unfortunately, the majority of traders fail to become consistently profitable. And is that because they quit? Maybe. Uh, is that because uh, they're not smart? No, definitely not. But it could be because they've given up in some way or they've transitioned to something else uh, because they're not getting instant uh, rewards. Uh, in trading, sometimes you do get that instant reward. and You have to be conscious that this is not going to last forever and that sometimes the money will come and sometimes the money will go. And no matter what happens, uh, you have to be constantly paying yourself. Right? That's what we talked about here. Pay yourself. Uh, you see profits, take profits. Um, and another statistic that I found really interesting and one that I didn't know um, was that actually 60% of consistently profitable full-time traders have multiple streams of income. So they're not, they're not relying. The majority of these consistently profitable traders are not relying on their trading for their actual income. And I think, as we've spoken to some people here, that that actually gives you some sort of confidence, right? You know that your bills are paid, you know that you can afford the groceries, you know that your kids are taken care of. Um, so at the end of the day, the pressure is not on you. You don't have to make it or break it, right? And for those of us who have transitioned full time, um, there can be a lot of pressure. And, and obviously those months when you don't get a positive, you don't get a paycheck, you actually go negative. Uh, that can be pretty scary. You could think, oh my gosh, this is a trend. Uh, is this something I'm gonna get, lose all my money? Right, and of course, as, as humans, we go to the worst case scenario, right? Because we wanna prepare ourselves for that possibility. Um, but it was quite interesting to me that, that over 60% of those consistently profitable traders have multiple streams of income. So they're not solely relying on trading uh, for their income. So. And you can't really turn up at your parents with three kids in a wife and says, sorry, dad. <laughs> can, I just, hundred days long. can I just come back in? You're like, uh, I think so. <laughs> Well, with that, I think we should definitely jump into our questions for the coaches today. And of course, if you have, we want to make this more of an open discussion. So if you do have questions or you want to comment, uh, please feel free to raise your hand. So we have one over here. Yes. Come on up. 
Hi, uh, my name is Press. I have two questions for you guys. So I have a wife, two kids. I have a mortgage to pay. I have a, I have a church, and uh, we have a. Um, how can I say? Um, we started to join Chart Champion, right? And my question is this: What I what I discerned or sense is that many people try tries to become successful, and many people lacks uh, because of. Maybe it's not uh, near based. It's it's everything's online. So my question is number one: Is it proven or statistically shown that um, online content? I mean the content are great. The content that you guys are making are great. Uh, but if you have less spare time, um, how do you um, how do you have the chance to make that? You know, like going through all the contents. Uh, and, and make it first. Um, that's my number one question. Like, yeah. And then, based on the answer, I have a second question or an uh, idea. Maybe, yeah. Cool. Yes. Yeah, cool. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. So, in in so to just so I fully understand the question, there, it's like with l less time. Like, how do you go through all the content? Is that that's correct? Yeah, and also like, how many people? Uh, went through to all the models and make made it like made it statistically. Okay, cool. You have a statistic for your own that charge of it. It's not. I'm just. Yes. Yeah. I, I I cool. Yeah. I understand the question. Yeah. So in, in terms of the statistics, we we don't have that information okay. because it, there would be no way for us to verify it. Mm -hmm. um, it would be very interesting, but then you could have people lie. We have no way to verify that, so we don't keep a statistic of like. Um, or of course we can use a statistic from a, a survey, but there's no a hundred percent way we can just go off of a survey. And we we have given surveys out, but we cannot a hundred percent know uh, how many of the community actually are uh, saying doing what they're saying they're doing, right? So I don't have any like a, a hundred percent. I don't have like any certain statistics like that. But I would say in terms of people with, and I'm sure so many people here. Um, would even have a better answer than me but uh, if I can just think of what it would be like if you are like really low on time and you are, have thousands of hours of content on the website I think you would have to put yourself realistic goals so set yourself maybe you just have 30 minutes every other day but then make sure you set yourself to do that 30 minutes every other day so I know there's, you know, I've spoken to people, you know, they've got their, like yourself, like wife, kids, full-time job, you know, how are they meant to learn to trade on top of doing all this other stuff, which is stressful. And that's why it's so important to understand that naturally it's going to take more time if you've got this super busy life versus, you know, an 18 year old that can just dedicate 10 hours a day to learning. It's gonna, you just have to know it's definitely going to take more time. And then with that set a realistic, um, learning path for yourself and like everybody's learning path will, will be individual and so if it's only 30 minutes every other day make sure you stick and do that because you know otherwise you're going to have an excuse oh today i'm too tired today i'm too busy today I, this came up but you have to be very very strict on yourself uh, i would say is important point as well and yeah with that realistic expectation that that you know this could take five years to do and rather than feeling the, the pressure, I know some people are like, wow, five years, this is so long. But if you think about it, five years in the grand scheme of things, it's not a long time to learn how to trade. So especially when you think the average is three years, you know, if you're slow, you know, you've got less time to learn, five to 10 years even, like I don't think that's a crazy amount of time to dedicate to learning to trade. Uh, as long as you're seeing consistent, you know, gains of seeing your knowledge increase, that should also motivate you, you know, if you're doing it once every few days, but slowly but surely you're so I think I, I can't remember the exact quote, but and I can't remember who it was now, but there's a quote like you just want to see yourself improve like one percent every day. Yeah. So it's yes. not it's not about going for the you know, learning everything in a month. It's about just every day one little little bit better. And even if you're dedicating ten minutes a day, it's like your lingo, right? 
you know, Duolingo, people actually learn the language for Duolingo, you know, studying uh, 10 minutes a day. So it's just that little bit every day. And then it might not seem a lot but over the course of a year, two years, three years, 10 minutes a day is, is massive. And everybody has that. There's no excuse, like not, not to have that. So that, that's what I would do, like break down the lessons into, into however much time you can, you can dedicate. That's what I would say for, for that. I have quite a thing to add. So when I was learning the module, there was not as many modules as there is now. And I know, you know, I go on the website and it is overwhelming. There's yeah. an immense yeah. amount of knowledge yeah. there. And for a trader to go there and to start, I'll say, where do I start? There's just so much left, right and center. But if you just pick like from A to B, for example, when I started, you know, the car journeys from London into where I live, it was like one hour, a good day, a 45 minutes average, and I used to just play the video. I wasn't looking at Daniel, I, you know, his voice was all over the place, <laughs> but I was absorbing that information. And, you know, if you travel to work there and back, maybe that's 15 minutes, a toilet break, whatever it may be, just always have, you know, a lesson plan and just watch, even if it's like you say, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, just try and absorb as much, as much as information as you can make notes and don't have a time of what you want to achieve to learn this because it can take you five years like you were saying it could be two months i mean th that would be you know really <laughs> <Very> incredible because <laughs> you'd be like 40 you know 24 7 but just you know try as much as you can to at least understand and learn as much as you can and then you can come up with your own unique strategy because Seven will teach you his strategy. I will teach you some things. Daniel will teach you his way. But it's down to you to then pick up exactly what you resemble with. Like you might not want to do swing trading. You want to do day trading, depending on what you want to do. So if you focus on that and says, okay, I'm going to do these modules. You know, my plan for the next three weeks, one month is to at least finish five lessons. And those will be A, B, C, D. And then you just do those. Okay, I can only have five minutes today, 10 minutes tomorrow, just try and regroup them. But you know, if you're really serious, and if, if this is what you want, just like Eleanor said earlier, this is the path, then you have to take it. You have to believe in yourself, go for it, and just study hard. You take out what you put in. So, you know, I did it. I, I was listening to videos, every opportunity. I mean, all my kids knew Daniel before they met him. They were like, oh, hello. <laughs> it's like he was part of the furniture, <laughs> honestly, because, and you, you, you guys know this, true? Like, you know, like I had people early this morning saying, oh, you know, it's finally, I, 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 I've seen you every day for the past <laughs> however many years, and they, here you are. It, it's the same. So go at it. Just throw yourself in there and just do your best. That's all you can do. It's your best, but you will have to go above and beyond, and I love that. 1% a day really, really makes a difference long term. You're not going to see it immediately, but you will feel it later. Do you have a part two? There's, yeah. there's only one thing I would like to add, and that is um, I have a friend who's also a member of CCN. He's a heart surgeon, has three children and also a wife, so he's pretty busy. And I got his feedback that what helps him the most is set aside two days a week where he is able to focus at least for 30 minutes. And then he has his time schedule and he reviews that every um, month to see if he checked the box and did the 30 minutes. And once you, so that is what Daniel said, it really comes in 1% a day, the small steps. Yeah. So once you see a little bit of success doing that, you can transition over to maybe requesting one day off at work and trying to add that additional day. And then it becomes two days, then maybe three days. And then you can think about becoming full time. But um, one more thing he told me is that um, he had to make sure to not to focus on trading during these times because sometimes when he gets off of work, it is at 7 or 8 p.m. and he is somewhat like forcing trades and he was like, okay, now I have 30 minutes so I have to trade. Yeah, yeah. And um, the game changer for him was to not focus on trades. If there's not a trade present, just watch some videos, watch live trading streams even if it's just 30 minutes, but do something that is related to trading, but it does not, doesn't have to be trading exact. So like the actual trading itself. Yeah, thank you so much. Second question is, um, coming from the IT background, uh, in Microsoft, you have boot camps, you have um, certificates for certain um, engineering, whatever you do. So, I have a question, like, I know you, you guys are busy and you're doing already in life and so on, but is there an opportunity in the future, like, that you are creating 
uh, boot camp like a week in a year somewhere in Europe where my many people can join. Um, they you teach them the fundamentals and also they can get certi certified, but also they can do this um, you know in depth like okay um, you teach the in the evening they do some trades they analyze it and then you give them feedback or something like that. That we something that that for me would be awesome because of the time space I can plan my holidays or plan and then I can fully go through some stuff like basics, middle and whatever. And then that will be awesome. Also for, I think Top Champion has a big learning platforms and they're doing a great job, right? So <laughs> that's what I, I wish that for me or I don't know. Yes, yeah. So yeah, I, I would say that that's one thing that a lot of people have actually said to me uh, during yesterday and today that they want like some sort of boot camp. They want a, like a, uh, a, a like an exclusive like five if you know a few people like day where they would in the morning we do our daily plan together, then we trade together, and then we end the day. So it's something that like is, is definitely being requested that we'll have to like think about like is uh, how would this work? And I'm not against it, but. Um, it's definitely something that's that is yeah seems to be highly highly requested, and then I would say something that we are implementing like for sure is we are going to be implementing quizzes onto the website, mm -hmm. so it's not the same, yeah. but we will have every after every module there will be a quiz, and then you can see where you are right, well, obviously what you're right, what you're wrong, and then once you've watched all the modules and you've answered all the quizzes, there will be achievements. Obviously, these are not going to be like certificates, so to yeah, speak. Yeah. They'll just be like achievements, so you can see, hey, I passed this, and then other people in the community can recognize, oh, this guy's done all the modules, he's answered all the questions right, adds a little bit more of a, a, a system, credibility system. So we're, we're, we're implementing that. But yeah, the boot camps is something that is, yeah, highly requested and something that we can, yeah, look into into the future for sure. Thank you so much. Cheers, man. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of your career and what was the turning point for you to go all in full time trading? Sure. Um, yeah, but <laughs> going to you a little bit before, um, I wake up in the morning, it's raining, <laughs> I don't have the beach, <laughs> and I've got three kids pulling my legs off the bed. <laughs> so, yeah, no, just kidding. Um, yeah, the evolution. So, um, for me, it was all about timing and it was like a pre sort of plan. So you can't really like, um, I mean, you have to have a little bit of like, it's not luck, but um, I built a business up. I was in manufacturing and when you are dependent on other manufacturers to rely your product, but to deliver your products, it's really hard because for example, like buying raw materials was becoming really, really like expensive, like especially around Brexit to, to import stuff from like Europe um, from China into UK was just very difficult. And um, when in manufacturing, you have like contracts with companies, for example, like car dealers, they need to produce those cars. So if you don't supply that part, you get penalized and that could be like a thousand dollars a day or a thousand euros a day, whatever currency they are at. So there's a lot of external factors that it doesn't matter how well you run your business, there's always the risk. That's why I'm very good at risk management. That if you don't, if that supply is not a problem, like for example in China, there's a shipping container that can't get there in time, the supplier doesn't care about that. You, you know, that's your problem. In other words, my problem. So I've always felt there was always an external kind of like thing that I could not control, but I would do my very best. So for example, in my case, what I did, I bought a warehouse <laughs> and I always overbought material. And by doing that, I was actually technically trading, but I was not aware of it at the time, and that was on the early days. So I was buying a lot of material, getting good price for it, and then I was like reselling it back, and then obviously there was like a, you know buying and selling and you know mass quantities, and I was technically trading, being unaware of it all, and I was like, yeah, this is this is fun. Like when you have a bit of cash, obviously that's you know one two percent, it really makes a difference. So I had all of that, and then I built the business up. To a point where it could be sold so again investments so the transition is very much like you have to have those safety nets 
you have to have that kind of like bank, um, the, uh, the, the backup plan, the safety bucket, um, and then everything kind of just follows from there on. So it's, it's a combination of everything aligning um, and then realizing that you are trading anyway. Um, and yeah, it's, it, you can't, how can I explain? It's, it's, it's really hard to explain, but it's everything aligns. And then you just know that that's the time that you, you either make the switch then or, you know, it's going to have to be a lot later on. And uh, yeah, for me, it was that. Awesome. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Yep. Feel free. Come on. Yep. <clears throat> um, I suppose my question is, I've had a few months of like profitability and it's, you know, great. And some good months, some bad months, whatever. And obviously you have to go through that stage where you're just grinding, 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 you know, nonstop until you reach your level. And obviously you guys still grind very hard. Did you get to a stage of profitability where you were like, cool, like, not that you know everything, but you know, not that you figured it out, but you're comfortable. And then you just sat down and you're like, right, where am I going to disperse my income? You know, because you don't want to just be sitting at the chart for like 18 hours a day. Did you have that moment where you were like, cool, now I'm going to invest in businesses or real estate? Like, is that what you now focus mostly on instead of, I don't think you guys need to sit in front of the chart 16 hours a day. Do you kind of now sit there and go, right, I made a lot of profits. Now I'm going to like put the money to work. And like, what kind of areas did you look at? Like, I know Severin talked about investing in stocks and I suppose I'm getting a few payouts now. So I'm like, what can I do with the money? Like obviously save and blah, 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 but can't have the money sitting in the bank all the time. Right. So kind of what your process is when you're starting to get payments and they're decent size and where you want to go forward with in terms of. That's a very good question. So for example, like currently with interest rates being high, yeah. you actually, the banks are actually offering, some banks are actually offering good rates to have you cash there, but it's not the recommended. So yeah. ETFs, places like that, stocks, you know, uh, those nice assets, gold, for example, you can yeah. put, you know, some of your profits there. Um, but yeah, it's just having that investment and diversification. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. You guys read and properties as well. Yeah, properties is always a good place. Yeah. Um, but obviously you need a little bit more than you know. That's the yeah. kind of like game plan yeah. is obviously just focus on trading for the beginning because you just you have to go through those years of grinding and obviously the results will come and then I suppose you can take a little step back, obviously still trade and keep learning, but then you can start implementing funds in different places, I suppose. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, I can add something to that because for me, it's always about how I can maximize output with the same uh, yeah. amount of time. So um, actually what got me into trading ES and NASDAQ was that I was trading Bitcoin, but I had to do the ES and NASDAQ analysis for reference and correlation purposes. And then I was like, all right. Um, and I remember we had this conversation in Madeira stock and I was like, yeah, I'm putting in all this time analyzing ES and NASDAQ, I might as well trade it. So that, that was what got me into trading ES and NASDAQ. So now I'm sitting in front of the ES and NASDAQ all day, all day. I monitor the context, so I monitor the high time frame as well as the low time frame. And then I was like, all right, I should maximize that because um, keeping money in my bank account doesn't really make sense. So I should probably develop a long-term strategy on the ES and NASDAQ, an investment strategy. Yeah. So while I'm preparing myself for trading, I'm at the same time looking for investments in the ES yeah. and NASDAQ. And that in itself is a very good use of my time, in my opinion, because I put aside yeah, most of my profits and put that into the ES and NASDAQ as a long-term investment with a um, long-term uh, stock market strategy. Uh, so buy fair for you. Don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, mate. I appreciate it. No, I do, do have a, a comment as well. I got this uh, breakdown from Ray Dalio. I don't know if anybody's heard of Ray Dalio, but he's one of the greatest hedge fund managers in the entire world. He's been incredibly consistent over his entire career. I believe he's retired now, but he has a few books out. And uh, I'll just read this breakdown because this is kind of how I'm looking at it. When I get a payout uh, from prop firm or I get a payout from my self-funded accounts, I'm typically looking to go in this type of portfolio. So it's 30% stocks, low cost ETFs. And, and you have to look because there's um, some mutual funds that are a little bit different. Maybe they have higher management fees. And those management fees actually do eat into your profits over, they can amortize that over like 50 years. Those management fees can be really, really rough. So you're looking for a zero point something, right? You don't want a 1.5 or a 2.5 or something. So the lowest cost ETFs you can get, NASDAQ, ES, something that captures the whole market, even if it's like a, 
a broad-based index that just captures one you know big sector of the market and whatever you're interested in too whatever you whatever you use the things you the things you utilize um, and a lot of those big companies are covered in those ETFs and then you can also do about so 30% in stocks low-cost ETFs 40% in long-term bonds so you get to capture some of that interest rate volatility right so interest rates go up um, those long-term bonds are good then if short-term interest rates go down sometimes those long interest rates uh, those longer-term bonds like 30 year 10 year those are actually you know, quite bullish in that scenario because uh, people are expecting over the long term that, hey, I'm going to park my money somewhere safe, somewhere I can get a good return. Um, and that's more of a, a safe place. This is like an investment long-term portfolio. Um, okay, so we've got 30% stocks, 40% long-term bonds, 15% in intermediate bonds. So that would be like five, 10 year, two year, uh, stuff like that, shorter interest rates. You can capture that, that uh, shorter term uh, fluctuations. And then 7.5% uh, in gold and 7.5% in commodities. And a lot of commodities, especially right now, uh, we've got a few international affairs going on. So uh, things like copper and titanium and, and metals, things that are really used in a lot of uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, a lot of those markets are really booming right now because of the current geopolitical situation. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say is just, just find a, a portfolio setup that works for you. One that doesn't eat too much in the fees and then just stick to it. And, and like we were talking about earlier, the consistency factor um, and whether that's, you know, every time you get a payout, you just put half of it into long-term savings, half of it goes into your pocket, and then that half of it, you know, you use to pay taxes or whatever. Um, so that would be my, my suggestion in that way. That's nice. Give me a sec. I just pulled up that, uh, <laughs> those notes. So I got to shift back those here. Goodbye. All right, our next question is for Severin. And this one I'm actually very interested in because uh, as, as a someone who's been full-time for a little while, um, I'm still getting used to the, the income volatility, right? And so my question for you is uh, a major challenge we face as new full-time traders is income volatility, right? We're used to, we just talked about this, we're used to getting a paycheck, we're used to having that uh, every two weeks or every week, whatever, you're getting that money, the cash flow coming into your bank account. We get used to that and uh, becomes you know, maybe not we're uh, expecting it, but maybe we take it for granted a little bit. So when you first got started, uh, did you put a financial buffer in place? And, and what did you do to uh, acclimate yourself to that income volatility? Yeah, so obviously a very unique thing when it comes to trading. But at the end of the day, that's the same for every business uh, owner, I would say. So um, there's no guarantee profit. So we have income volatility. And one of what I did before I started out was um, set aside a financial buffer of two years at least. So I would survive two years without making a single penny trading. And that really helped me to focus on trading and not focus on the money. Because what I heard from many people is if you chase the money, that's not going to um, end in really good trading results. So for me, it was about the stress and uh, pressure management, but I was very fortunate that my uh, family supported my decision to become full -time tra a full-time trader and also uh, supported me financially. And um, yeah, for me, it's also it's a system that I have in place is um, when I start the month and I reach a certain profit target, I just um, withdraw that money and put that into a separate account. So. I want to make sure that at the end of each month, I at least reach this target. That is a very low target, but I want to make sure that whatever happens the rest of the month, I have at least these or these profits, right? Because sometimes we might have experienced that we had a good start of the month, the first week was awesome, and then in the next week we lose all of it. So I want to avoid that. So I always want to set aside the first profits to have that locked up. So um, for me personally, that's really giving me a lot of calm, calmness for the rest of the month that I will be pro protected whatever happens next. And then once I made additional profits, I can be a little bit more risky in my trading or at least increase the position size because I'm already on the safe side. So um, that is something that I did and I also... So this is, that comes down to personal preference. But for me, sometimes I don't even like to focus on daily targets because what I realized, especially in the beginning when it gets a little bit volatile with the trading profits, focusing too much on daily targets can, or it might happen that you end up in a bad mood at the end of the day because you always review, obviously, did I reach my profit target? No, no, 
are getting too late, okay? So you go to bed a little bit upset, worried about the next day, then you wake up still and having that mindset of the previous day, want to achieve the profit target again. Okay, I didn't achieve it again, so get that downward spiral. So I would say focusing on a profit target is a little bit more advanced, and I call it a soft profit target. So I, I have a number in mind, but I'm not focused on that too much to reach that every single day. Because that's just adding too much pressure and, and I just want to trade easy and calm. That's it. I just wanted to add one thing to that. My, my background is in risk management and insurance and I have a degree in this. And one of the first things they taught us about assets, asset risk management is that there's a couple of different methods that you can do. There's something called separation, right? You, you separate the assets so that if one, let's say one building burns down, then you may still have another building left. Or you can duplicate things. Let's say you have uh, very sensitive documents. Maybe you have them on one server that's uh, protected, but you also have them on another server that's you know, also guarded and protected. So you can separate those assets. And then there's avoidance, right? You can completely avoid whatever it is that might be risky. And obviously we're not going to avoid trading <laughs> because it's what we love to do. Um, so that leaves us separation and duplication. And just what Severin was talking about, well, if you make the money and you have the money in your pocket, why not separate it? You know, why not put it somewhere where it'll be safe? Um, and if you can, you know, you're so lucky, maybe you can duplicate it, right? You can put it in multiple accounts, uh, multiple uh, different vehicles, right? So one long-term investments, maybe some real estate, uh, maybe some uh, hard assets like gold, silver, uh, metals. Um, so yeah, that would be another uh, addition to that question. Okay. Yeah. Joshua? Max? I have a question regarding uh, getting profits out. Um, but what I still like, Find a bit of hard, just like how many, how much around how many, you don't have to say the exact number, but like are you looking at 60%, 50%, 20%? Because you still want to make use of the compounding effect. So, how much do we take out and reinvest? Because that's something where I still find difficulties with. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, for me, it is a very low percentage, but it comes down to how many, how much profits you make, obviously. Yeah. Because, um, I wouldn't focus on the compounding effect if you want to set aside your monthly profit target. You can focus on that afterwards. So from my experience, that's still going to work. That is just giving you the confidence and the calmness to focus on that compounding effect. So it is something to take into consideration, but only if you, even if you put aside a few hundred um, for a monthly profit target, that's all right. And that's not really going to affect your um, compounding goal. So like you take about six percent of the of your profit, so no, I'm not doing that. No. But I'm doing that at the end of the month. So yeah. that is where I am setting aside shit money for tax, obviously. Then I'm setting aside my long-term investments. So at the end of the day, these profits are still working in my long-term investments. But uh, I was very focused on growing accounts, but I kind of reduced that a little bit and uh, focused a little bit more on paying myself. Because um, at the end of the day, you never know um, if you want to keep too much money on an account, on an exchange. So it's better to be safe than sorry and um, just uh, withdraw some profits. Thank you very much. And I actually do have a little bit of a different strategy. So uh, particularly in futures, um, and this just comes from my experience in having built accounts and then completely wiped them out. Um, <laughs> we all know how that feels, so hopefully not. Um, what I do is that, let's say I'm day trading, it's a Monday, and I make a $1,000 profit. I'm gonna send myself $500 same day wire transfer. Because for me, I want to realize those profits as soon as possible. And I'll leave the other 500 in the account to grow the account. And, and that's worked really, really well for me. And it's not only just seeing the fruits of your labor, but you, you get to see it in two different places, right? So I see, them, I see the notification in my bank saying you've received a wire transfer. And then I also look at my account the next day when I start trading and I say, oh, I'm up. You know, so you kind of get the benefit of both there. So that was a great question. Okay, thank you, Max. Cool. All right, do the next question. This one's for Coach Daniel. So we just heard an interesting statistic that 60% of full-time traders rely on multiple streams of income. And we've talked a little bit about this, diversifying of assets, but uh, do you mind telling us a little bit about uh, some of your additional income streams and what you'd like to focus on, uh, particularly when taking out some profits and putting them into other uh, assets? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I, I could keep this one relatively quickly because obviously you had a question from earlier. It's, it's, it's very similar in the end. So uh, for, for me, there's three main ways that I would look to uh, diversify. And of course, I would always say diversification is super, super important. Um, 
uh, number one for me is always going to be real estate. Just a safe investment. I think uh, I personally buy houses to rent it out and there's no mortgages. It's just all cash. I've never had a mortgage. And so that for me is a very safe investment like the house generally speaking is making money and then i'm getting rent on top of that every month so um i've never gone into commercial real estate a lot of people have, always, have offered me so many opportunities but i'm like no i'm not interested in commercial i'm just happy with um you know getting into you know rat random uh, you know getting properties several at a time whatever and then just renting them out to to people um, but yeah, for me, real estate always going to be number one. Uh, number two is uh, dividend payments. So this is like a two in one. You can uh, invest in stocks, some really, really good stocks, and at the same time get dividend payments. And so this is like, I think it's a no, for me, it's like a no brainer. It's a very, very good uh, strategy because then generally speaking, you're investing into good companies that you believe in anyway, and they you would expect to grow in price over the years. And then every month, or uh, not everyone pays that every month, of course, but let's just say every month, you can get a dividend payment from that uh, company as well. So you're, pay, you're getting paid to hold a stock that's also going up in price. That for me is like, um, yeah, like a no-brainer. And if you relate it to crypto, I forgot what they call it in crypto now, but you know, you can- Staking? Staking, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can stake crypto. Um, would I recommend staking in crypto though? That this is the problem. Like I would, I would have at one point, um, but now I probably wouldn't because the good thing about dividend payments is I know I'm investing in companies that are going up in price. So I'm happy to get my dividend payments every few months. And I'm also more happy to see the stock going up in price because my investment is more, you know, significantly bigger than the, the dividend payments every month, right? That's a small percentage. It's nice but it is a small percentage. Whereas uh, I've had a lot of, uh, you know, bad uh, experiences with staking in crypto because yes, they're offering like 20, 30% APY and I'm thinking, wow, this is crazy. I'm getting like several grand a day. Um, but then at the same time, I look at my investment and now it's down like 80%. Right. So it's like, it's not really worth 30%, uh, you know, a year, a um, couple grand a day. It looks really good, but then I'm like, wow, I've lost a couple mil on this. So it's, it's not really worth it. Um, so yeah, I think staking is good in crypto, but you uh, you got to be careful because you can get very um, you know taken away by the APY returns. They look very they look very generous, <laughs> uh, but they, from my experience, have ended every time very badly. So that's why I think if it comes to crypto, I'm only I only want to trade it. I don't want to hold on to altcoins anymore. I don't want to um, think about staking any of the assets. So again, this is personal viewpoint, but I do think crypto is very, um, I don't want to say that's like scammy per se, but I think it's very sell you dreams and um, they're not really thinking about the customer when they sell you those dreams. So just be very careful with crypto in general. And then the last avenue that I use a lot recently, uh, and this is in more recent times, is just simply um having money in banks and not just what i would say because i've everybody knows go to your bank create a high interest account you can maybe get in the uk right now four percent i think is like an average in the uk but um what i would recommend is actually opening bank accounts in different countries so of course you could have a bank that will let you diversify into other currencies but they're probably not going to get the best rates so what you can do is actually um, open bank accounts in different, um, you know, different countries. And that way you're diversifying your money. Let's say I have a bunch of great British pounds and I open a bank account, uh, let's say in Georgia, they got a good interest rate. I can uh, diversify my great British pounds. So I'm not just holding great British pounds, I'm holding other currencies, but at the same time, this other currency, currency can, off, can be offering like an 8% interest rate or more. So, and what you would say is you want the only thing I would say with this is you have to be careful because let's say, uh, let's just use uh, yeah, Georgia as, a, as an example, if you would interest. So you have to be a bit careful with which bank you're choosing because you know you have to understand that there could the, the, the failure rate of that bank is going to be higher than what it would be in the UK. Uh, so you do have to be a bit more careful, but if you do some due diligence, you know, if you make sure you're investing into a well known long term bank. They can offer good interest rates, you're diversified. You can be, and what I like about it is it's so safe. Like I love real estate. 
I'm, as you can probably tell, I'm super safe guy when it comes to money. Like I'm gonna love real estate because I think it's super safe. Dividend payments, super safe. Um, and then bank interest, I, I say super safe as well. It's like well-known banks. I'm getting four to 8% a year, a little bit more in some countries, but that for me is amazing, especially when you, you know, you're thinking about the types of money, like it's a, you know, they're getting good money every month and I don't even have to think about it. So that is some of the ways, top three ways that I would say, and are safe, good. And I think any, any, everyone can do the last two. Real estate is like the last one you get into because you need the most capital, but the first two, you should be doing it. Well, I'm not financial advice, but I think it's like one well, we should do like as soon as possible. Yeah. And just a few notes on that, and just to tie a common thread there, I think all of the things that you mentioned are cash flow generating assets, right? So you want to put your money into something that's bringing you more money, right? Not something that could potentially lose you money, um, especially your safe money, right? If you have a, a pot of money that maybe you're using for more aggressive trading or uh, crypto, then I would say try to try to diversify the things that have some sort of cash flow. Um, and then one last note on staking. <clears throat> How many were involved in the uh, Terra Luna project? Yep. A few people here. Well, if you don't know that uh, that set of coins, one was a stable coin, one was the Luna asset, and they have completely gone to zero. Um, and back in the day, a few years ago, I, I had over six figures staked in the Terra stable coin, right? It was earning 20%. I earned about five figures in a year, uh, just based off this APY. And one of the things I would say, if you're going to be staking, especially for stable coins, you have to keep alert set and you have to be keeping an eye on the stable coin peg. Um, because as soon as the Terra asset broke its $1 peg, I was out. And then I think a week or two later, it went to zero. And so I could have, if I said, well, maybe I'll wait around, I'll see if it goes back up. Um, I could have potentially lost everything that I had in that in that particular uh, investment. So if you are going to be staking, just make sure you're protecting yourself and uh, keeping alerts on the pegs, as well as uh, keeping an eye on where your money is best served. So yeah, thank you. A few more questions. I actually want to ask this one to Igor and Sandra, if you guys don't mind. So obviously you guys have both uh, transitioned to full-time. Can you talk about some of the biggest mistakes that you made early on in your trading career and maybe how you overcome some of those obstacles? Um, mistakes, wow, okay, we all do crazy mistakes, but um, yeah, I mean, I had a few notes. Um, for me, like, what I could recommend on doing the transition is try and keep your job for as long as you can, um, whatever you do. If you're a business owner, and I think there's quite a few in here, right? Uh, I've spoken to a few. What I did is... I actually delegated, I trained a person in the company, I delegated and I put a lot of procedures, so I spent a lot of time to put a lot of procedures in place that I could be a little bit more on the back burner, like uh, away from the scene, and I could focus on my learning and trading as well. So if you are running a business, try and train someone up, obviously that's gonna be time consuming, uh, you're gonna have to spend some money on getting that person up to speed, um, but that person needs to be trustworthy that you can step away from the office, you know, focus on what you need to do, but try and keep as much as you can for as long as you can until you are at that stage that like you can look back and say, everything is ticking along, that person is in charge, is doing well, you've got your learning on track, you've got your cash flow coming through, your trading is on, on, you know, on point, and that's when you can make that decision. So build that buffer, keep someone looking after your business. If you don't have a business, you have kids, dependents, obviously that's a different story. You're gonna to have to figure it out by, you know, just continue your day job. Um, so yeah, I mean, not so much mistakes, but more tips on how you can get there. But yeah, for me, what really helped was having someone that. I mean, I didn't particularly really like this person, but he was brilliant on his job. <laughs> I'm being honest, but he was absolutely amazing. I could go away, um, do my thing, and I would come back, and you know, if there was a problem, he'd get on with it. And manufacturing is very uh, volatile, just like crypto <laughs> back in the days. Uh, machines break, the raw materials don't arrive on time. There's honestly so many moving parts that it is scary at times, and you have to have a a risk plan and and that was part of like the transition for me it's like you can be as good as you can but there's always going to be external factors like uh, politics um anything really so 
and yeah, try and keep that job for as long as you can. You can if you can have someone that you rely on, just put them in charge so you can learn because we need time to learn this thing. You know, it's, it doesn't happen from night to day. Um, and build that pathway because that pathway, once it's in place, you can then go, all right, you can sit down and you can put that trade on thinking, okay, if this goes wrong, I've got that to fall back on. Um, so there's quite a few ways, but these are a few tips. And the one I did was, you know, making sure that I had someone that was looking after certain things that I didn't have to worry. But it was a long process, it took me about six months just to get that person up to speed on systems and things. And then I could step away a little bit. Um, and that person eventually went on and actually stayed with the company. So I still have a stake in it. Um, and again, that's another, you know, stream of income. So, um, you know, you just have to be kind of like a little bit clever on how you do it. Um, but that's a tip that I can give to you. So for, for some of the business owners, maybe you can um, mirror or do something similar if you are in a position to do so. Yeah, and I want to take it to the mistakes I did. That might sound a little bit controversial because I know that we are all very passionate, but for me it was too long hours because I was working 16 hours a day. I was spending 16 hours in front of the charts every day. And for me, what I ended up doing is losing profits at the end of the day where, because uh, my focus just slipped. So what I had to learn and what I would recommend my younger self is to set um, fixed hours or working hours that I will work and then I'm going to take a break. I need a break after a two hour um, streak of trading, for example. So this is something I would really re recommend you to do because I remember myself being in my old office working 16 hours, maybe taking one or two breaks this entire day and then yeah, sometimes being very upset about losing the profits that I might make in the morning when I was still focused. So don't let your focus slip because you are too focused on, or uh, glued to the street, uh, screen. So. Wonderful, thank you. Now we just have one more question, and then doing, we'll be wrapping it up here. Um, and this question, I'd like to pass it to each of you, because I know each of you have a different strategy or a different daily routine that you have. So the question is, uh, obviously having a structured daily routine is key to trading success, especially if you're a full-time trader. Um, how do you balance the demands of full-time trading while also remaining true to yourself and your higher purpose? Cool. So yeah, I would say in terms of like my daily routine, first of all, like uh, I, I think it's very important to like start the day, feel refreshed and, and, you know, keep the same, keep, keep what you're doing daily the same. So I would wake up, um, you know, obviously take a shower, go to my computer. But what I've implemented recently that's a lot different is now I'm a swing trader. And I find this um, helps my routine a lot because I know exactly what I'm going to be doing. I, I'll wake up in the morning, I'll get ready in the morning, I'll do the daily update, well, every Tuesday and Thursday, I'll do the daily update and on the other days watch the daily update. And that prepares me already for the day ahead because the good thing with swing trading is that I know that not every day I'm going to be taking a trade. And so I see more often than not on, on a week, it's more like two or three times a week and then two days not trading. So, uh, or sometimes uh, I'll go like one whole week and not, not actually taking a trade. So my routine is more just like keeping myself updated on the charts of what's going on every day, like monitoring the charts. But I'm not, I just know that I'm not going to be taking trades every day. And that's like drastically different than what I, I used to do. And so I think that's just like an acceptance now of, uh, you know, my routine is no longer actively taking trades every day, but just monitoring the trades that I'm in. And that I, I honestly could do that in like five minutes. And that is really, really good with also now becoming like more involved as like the CEO of Chart Champions, because that does take a lot of my time. Um, and, and I actually enjoyed that a lot, that, that balance shift of like becoming more of like a CEO sort of thing, because that in itself was a new challenge. Like I feel like I mastered trading. And like, this is a brand new challenge for me. And so that naturally that takes up a lot of my time. I have to study and learn again about how to do this. So um, yeah, my routine now is, is more like wake up in the morning, uh, check the charts, has, my, has it even come to my entry? Uh, if, if so, then you know, look to take that trade if I'm not already in it or on the next day, is it anywhere near my entry? And some days, you know, that last week, let's say, for example, I remember I was in a stream with you guys and I already knew at the start of the stream, I'm not going to be taking any trades today. It's definitely not going to happen. So 
Um, you know, I, I know in the morning how likely it is. Is it likely to come to my take profit? Yes or no. And then I can judge like how much time do I need to be dedicated to looking at the charts. What I've learned that's really good is it's it's not a good use of my time. If I can see in the morning it's not near my level, why would I stay looking at the looking at the technical analysis all day? It's 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 not a good use of my time. So then I would prefer to use my time. Well, let's see what the team are up to. Do anybody need any help with this? You know, what can we look to improve upon? You know, X, Y, and Z with chart champions, and that that is a good use of my time. So I think yeah, my routine has changed recently over the years, and it's more uh, down to that like, swing trading and you know what my priorities are. Yeah, my routine has changed quite a lot actually. Um, I mean, from the days of running the factory, I used to just get in really early. In fact, I was the first one to get there, open up, get all the machines prepared and 3D thing. And by the time the workmen used to get in, um, everything was ready for them to just start production. Um, and I used to love that because I used to get there in no time because I was the only one driving down the M4 because <laughs> it was bloody early. Um, but it was a time for me to then sit in front of the charge by 6 a.m. And those, those were the days that the uh, Igor sessions kind of came up because I was looking at those specific times where the markets were turning around. So I chose my daily routine. For example, this is back then. So it was 6 a.m. I had already all, all that work done, scheduled, suppliers, everything was met. So work was pretty much all done within two hours because I used to get there around 4.30. So that was all done, and it was really early hours, but 3 o'clock I was finished, but it was 6 a.m. I was in front of the computer looking at the charts, looking for that opportunity, hence the uh, IS2. You know, yeah, yeah. And then we had London sessions, so I was always in front of the charts, setting up meetings, doing stuff, schedules, and always, always looking at the charts. So that was my routine, and then 12 o'clock, my lunchtime, I was always, again, just sat on the computer, just really getting that nice information for the IS3 kick in. <laughs> And that, that was my routine then. But now it has changed significantly because now I prefer to just kind of like help Lucy around with the kids in the morning as well. Because I think that's really important and it frees me also like during the day. So I know that that's taken care of. And it's very much like one hand takes the other where, you know, I help as much as I can and then I get the help that I need as well. And it, it then makes me wait, you know, two or three hours. I know, for example, you do your uh, early morning update a bit quicker because Rob, perhaps you've got a little bit more time. I like to just come back a little bit later and I've got a little bit more of an overnight session, for example. So I like to focus on that. So it has changed a lot, but in the beginning, it was a lot of work. I did not stop. So in my view, back then, I didn't really need an exercise or whatever gym because I was literally running left, right and centre in the fact like a little <laughs> I, don't, I was just running around. Um but yeah my routine has really, really shifted. Um so yeah. Yeah I feel like I've talked about my routine quite a lot already so I'm not gonna go too much into detail because you should know that. <laughs> and no but what I try to make sure is that when I wake up I try to do something that is either meditation or breath work that gets me into a good state of mind that I'm prepared for the day ahead. Then I'm doing my daily plans, my daily um, updates, as you know, the stock market update. And what I implemented since a year is also then going and have a workout that really helps me, to, helps me to maintain balance and focus throughout the day. And the new thing that I implemented is really focusing on my diet as well. I can feel that is having a great impact on my focus. So that is things that I recently changed or implemented, but other than that, I don't want to then talk about my daily routine for the hundredth uh, time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I hope you all know that. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I appreciate all of your answers.